What's going on, woke folk? This podcast got to know Greg's story. Super interesting. This is a man who has survived for long periods of time without using the money system whatsoever. He stood up to the man. He's an expert on natural law and uh, and sovereign law and, and being a sovereign man. So I thought this was just a blast. A lot of good stuff in there about the journey to, to self-realization. Just deep, deep stuff, powerful. Um, I loved it. I know you will too. It's a longy, but it's a goodie. Definitely worth the investment. So enjoy and see you in the next one. Are you ready to get woke? Welcome to the Woke as F*** podcast with your host, Alex Lazarev. Boom! We are back again. And what a special guest we have today. I'm super stoked. I've been hanging out with this guy for, for days. I've tripped on San Pedro with this dude, so I can say he's my bro. Uh, in the literal sense <laughs> and in many other senses. Uh, yeah, I've really known, gotten to know this dude. Cool dude who, with, with a passion who's really getting shit done on planet Earth. Uh, he's created several paradigm-shifting organizations on planet Earth, including New Earth Nation, the International Tribunal for Natural Justice, and recently, the Sovereign's Way Academy. Give it up. Give him some virtual love. The fantastic Greg Paul. Woo woo. What's it like having uh, two first names? That's the first. That's the first question. Is that a bit weird? Is it? Uh, have you seen? Uh, have you seen Greg Paul? Who's Paul? No, it's Greg Paul. Yeah, but who's the other bloke? No, no, it's one bloke. Is Greg Paul? Yeah, but what's Greg's last name and who's Paul? No, you don't understand. Like this must be happening. What's going on? Well, they actually. Uh, funny you say that. They actually are my two first names. I um, see. I choose not to use the um, surname that was that's. Um, that my family used for a very long time, really because, and you'll probably get from this story, I'll delve into that little um, reason why. You know, my path was very much about, um, same as yours, actually. Or was it probably about a similar time as well, like eight years ago? Yep, um, yep. I mean, it began 12 years ago and I really had a deep heart awakening um, and shifted my view and reality. I had no spiritual orientation before that whatsoever. Um, and suddenly, boom, there it is. I feel like I weigh as light as a feather. I can see auras around people and trees. I mean, what the fuck's going on? Looking for explanations. So the next four years was all about really stepping into a spiritual self. But then, yeah, go Before on. we get into all that juiciness, mm -hmm. let's give the people a little bit, because I know you're fucking, you're fucking wild, and I can pretty much guarantee this is going to be an epic podcast. But, but who... Let's go to the beginning. Who who the fuck are you? You're some fool, you're fucking some geezer from Manchester. Give us give us the download of sort of where you came from. What was your reality? Just normal human fucking child, teenager fucking reality. Who who were you before you even started doing this work? You know. Um. Yeah, I was just a kid like any other, but I never I kind of fitted in in that world brilliantly on the face of it. Everyone thought everyone saw that. Everyone saw a guy that just fitted in and that fitted and all that kind of stuff I was successful at everything but um, I didn't feel it you know so many insecurities so many um, for me I felt very insocial even though I appeared outwardly social um, and so I had this kind of half-life I was the golden boy of the family I was the only child but golden boy of the family first to go to university a kick-ass job earning good money all that kind of stuff um, and, you know, right from being an early age, I had this calling to change the world. But it was um, being brought up in the world that we were raised in. I felt that, or I thought, that the way to do that was with money and power. So I was out there getting it. And I was from a lower middle class suburban area of South Manchester and um, relatively normal life, school and stuff like that, but I always had this calling to do stuff. So I went into business. Um, I worked for a few years for some big companies and I set up my own house building company. I had this big plan, you know, I was going to be a millionaire by 30, a billionaire by 40, and I was going to go and take on some role at like, you know, I was going to use that money and power then to change the world. Um, but, you know, I get to about 27 years old and I realized how fucking ridiculous emotion that is so we dropped it all and um as around the time we were also finding out maybe nine years ago how the world really works 
you know, what them chemtrails in the sky, what them lines in the sky, how does the banking system work? How does money come into existence? How is human energy harvested by by people that sit behind a curtain? Um, all this stuff was like anathema to me. It was shocking. Um, you know, I was brought up in a very morally principled environment, so I had all these principles and stuff, and there was no way I could continue to just participate in it. Pay taxes, fund the war economy, bollocks to that. So, um, unlike any sensible human being who slowly architects themselves out of such a scenario and plans another life, I just said, no, enough. So one day, just didn't go into the business. Um, you know, I made sure the staff were okay and were on the way. Um, but apart from that, we just walked away from the business, cancelled every direct debit and standing order. And um, you're yeah, left with the question, well, how are you going to survive now? Yeah. So having been on a spiritual journey for some four years or so, you know, we were, I was very clued into all the concepts, spiritual concepts, but they were not all living through me as a living reality. You know, the idea that the universe provides and you get back what you give out. These were intellectual concepts for me, not really living realities, but I wanted to test them. I was, you know, I wanted to put all this stuff to the test, believe in it, have some faith in myself, in life, in reality. You know, I am all that is. At the time, that was just another concept as well, but I'm going to believe it because to a certain extent, you have to fake it to make it. You know, you have to you have to step into things you're not ready for. I have to have, it takes some courage in the first instance. But the whole point is when we run at this stuff, um, we're facing those things that require courage in this moment, those things we're afraid of, essentially. Um, what happens as we're facing those fears is they just start falling away. You see the futility of them, how they're ridiculous and unwarranted they were in the first place. And what is courage? To proceed in presence of fear get rid of the fear you don't need courage for anything anymore you can go and do anything walk into anything in life and you know this this is what you were doing about the same time eight years ago just, just walking in, into the sasha pua thing mm -hmm. yeah out there facing your fear with women yeah it's the biggest most important thing you've ever done in your life now facing fear well yeah i mean it, for me it didn't even start there i mean I, you know you don't think it was scary starting stand-up comedy 17 years old don't know myself, don't know shit, getting up in front of random people and telling jokes, fuck. Yeah. But I was like, that's terrifying. I'm going to do it. And I did it for 15 years. Mm -hmm. Made it my job. Yeah. And uh, well, well, you've done it, what, two, three times? Most of the fear is gone there. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's Honestly, how quick and easy it is. The two or first three times. time, the first time I did it, I was like, really? And that was it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's always some level, but it's a level that's manageable after yeah. that. It's not a big yeah. deal. Yep. yep, and then the same thing with, with, uh, with the girls, yeah, yep. absolutely. So we were doing the same stuff around the same time. It's just that my greatest fear wasn't women. It was authority. Probably partly because my father was also a police officer and there was a dynamic there and there was like this lack of... I've always been very articulate, but there's times where you just can't find the right words and then you feel, oh, you know, I, I always lived like this. Um, with a great deal of self-love and self-confidence, but also a great deal of self-loathing because of this sort of stuff. So I decided I was going to go out and face these fears. That fear was authority. And then at this point in time, I was also studying the law. I was seeing the law as a path to redemption very much. It was where the, the, the way out was, was in through that system. And so um, I'd look at you know, the question that was driving me at the time. Was, what is it that gives one man power? over another and that was the question that drove this entire two-year experience in my life really of going out and facing authority and uh, already getting into the essence of what natural law is for example you know that principle that living principle of justice that is effortlessly from the quanter of our heart when we're just aligned with reality um, and so I took a decision before I did all this. It was like, okay, from this day forward, I'm going to be guided by my conscience with everything I do. That's it. I'm going to listen to that still small voice and I'm going to do what it says. I, you know, I remember all those times before where actually that still small voice has come up and said, 
this one's better left alone. Or this one's something. And I've ignored it in the past. I know, what's, what's it, what does it bring you? 12 months, 2 years, 10 years suffering before you realise and you, the, the little voice wins out in the end every time. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to listen to you from now on. Everything I do. So it meant that, you know, I might be walking around town and I'd see an abandoned home. It's owned by the so-called council. It's been empty 20 years. There's no living man or woman that's got any interest in property whatsoever. And there's, there's homeless people on the streets. So I'm like, Jesus. So I'd go and seize the house and I'd put the homeless people in. And I'd get arrested. And um, so I was doing things like this and really, really facing that fear. And, you know, in the beginning, that, that sense of fear you get in your heart and chest, uh, it was palpable. But I had my, I thought I'd understood by this point in time how to be invisible in the world, how to actually, um, I say invisible, I mean really the means by which one can be impervious to false light authority. And by false light authority, I mean any man or woman that is attempting to wield power over another, be they authority figures, government, or otherwise. And so I was really out testing this theory. And there was a lot of things happened during this couple of years. Like I say, we um, took the decision to walk away from the business, cancel every direct debit and stand in order. I'd had a, um, a full life. We had a mortgage on a house. There was car finance stuff, there was all types of situations that were obviously going to come knocking at our door. We were like, okay, no, we're going to deal with it because the fact is that our mortgage was fraudulent and by continuing to pay it, I'm being complicit with fraud. The fact is that this here is fraudulent by continuing to participate. But taxes, all of this stuff, is, this was uh, antithetical to me to, um, to justice. And so I just stopped. Um, so there was, for example, always a, going to be a, a, um, a bank that wanted to foreclose on the home that we were living in and all that kind of proceeded. There was, there was an attempt at least to do so. And um, I remember, for me, I was also, having had that deep heart awakening some four years earlier, it was also, it was also all about love. And that's a world of fear. And how do you, you know, what, what's the only thing that actually beats fear? You can't go up against a gun-wielding army and beat it in a power struggle. Never have been able to. You can, however, bring love to a situation and allow it to, the light of truth to burn away all of the bullshit that that fear is trying to impose upon you. And so that's what I was doing. And um, I remember my very first police interview uh, and it was um, I, can't, I can't even remember what the situation was right now if, if we un forget the order of these things but I remember we had been in a cell for a couple of hours and I was holding for this interview and I sat there cross-legged I was sat cross-legged on the chair and for me I was I'm at my best when the chips are down you know there's when your back's against the wall, when you're in a situation that's generating loads of fear, for me, this is, I was always present enough to know, look, this is where I'm going to really learn, grow, get over some of this bullshit that I'm carrying inside me. So I'd just be breathing in that sense of aliveness and loving these interactions, even though I might have been shit scared at the time. And so I'm sat there cross-legged on this chair, and there's two police officers, and they say... Um, you're doing all the formal stuff, you know, this is an interview between such a police officer, such and such. And, and I said, guys, before we start this interview, there's something that you really need to know. Uh, it's really, really important, actually. And I said, what's that? I said, I looked at one and I said, I love you. And I love you. And they were gobsmacked. The jaws were on the floor. Didn't know what to do. I'm beaming, smiling. And then... Um, they were just knocked completely off their, their course. There's 20 seconds of silence, and I had to start the interview. So, so guys, well, there's some questions you wanted to ask me. 
And from there, I basically controlled the interview for the next 20 minutes. Uh, went mm-hmm. back to the cell. 20 minutes later, by the time the Crown Prosecution Service had had a chance to listen to the, um, the recording, I was ordered to be released. And it was like, wow, look at the power in this, the power in the truth, because that was all it was. And I'll let you into the, my little um, secret about the whole, this whole thing. So there was really two aspects to this, what gives one man power over another, how is authority wielded in this world. And one of them is, um, the, the main thing is ad- identity. The fact is that we've all got a psychologically misplaced sense of identity. Well, apart from those few people that have actually stepped into their true divine authority now, everyone's got a misplaced sense of identity. We're still identifying to some way or another with who and what we are in this world, the things, the possessions, the people, the relationships, all the stuff we're using to define ourselves instead of defining ourselves as, well, the absolute, all that is, the source of my power, God himself running through me, uh, that co-creative force. Um, but that, that kind of collective psychological disease we carry as a species, this misplaced sense of identity, is represented in the way the system operates. So what happens when, let's look at a life, you're born into this world, and in the first six weeks or so, one of your parents is going to go to a registry office, and they're going to, they're going to register you. Are they? No, because that's never what the law said. They are, oh, you register events, in time, moments in time, births, deaths, marriages. You register these things record these things and the if you actually read all that legislation they're actually giving events names the event of my birth is given that full name with family surname and all this thing why do i call myself by just my first and middle name to break the presumption that i'm that i have this belief that i am an entity that was created by an establishment so this this record is created and then you get issued a piece of paper with a government seal on it it says that this is crown copyright or whatever it is it's got your name on it and now you're going to use it to go and identify yourself with there's a dozen different court cases from the european high court and all these different places it says there is no no um law or judgment in existence that suggests that a birth certificate is evidence of identity that's the, that's the truth the system says it and yet we walk around identifying ourselves as something that belongs to that establishment. And it's dead. Everything that exists on paper is dead. That's why we call it to memorialize something and put it on paper. We're killing it. So then we go to then we're taken to school. You're taught to put your hand up like a good little boy twice a day to answer this is my name. Just so that when you get to 16 or 18 years old or whatever it is, you're going to go out in the world, you're going to sign a piece of paper for the very first time and commit yourself into slavery and that's the way the system works voluntarily the fact that we volunteer to be property of another property of the state every time we sign to say this so i stopped doing it i stopped ever signing using that i still stopped using that name i returned passport driving license to their originating places i burnt everything else with the name on it and rebirthed myself as this in this very free space for myself an identity that i was happy with names that my mother and father gave me which I've always liked and move forward in the world so the, the fact is the, the only way that we ever contract ourselves or the only thing that, that makes us um, what you, what, what's the right word um, susceptible to is not exactly correct but to law, man's law the laws of man, is when we identify ourselves as something that they can see and recognize. So if you don't do that, then none of the laws of man apply to you. The laws of nature will always apply to you. There's no getting away from them. The real truth that is that causing harm to another living being is wrong and everything else is a right and that is the truth of natural law. There's no getting around that, but there is getting around every other bullshit man-made law 
so that you can have the space in which to express divine law, fulfill your potential, step forward into this kind of stuff. But you've got to you've got to wipe that shit out before you have the space in order to do it. So that's what I was doing. Um, and so I was looking at the question, okay, well, how do you, how does one um, engage in authority situations without giving, ident- give, give, uh, without giving an identity that they can see and without creating a lot of trouble for themselves? You know, there's apparently a so-called law that it's a, um, we, we have to just start, th- I was just thinking outside the box, asking lots of questions, doing lots of self-inquiry. There was no studying around this. No one else was doing it. So I was just learning it. I was just following my own experience and intuition. I was looking at the questions and I'm like, okay, so there is actually a law. There's a man-made law that says if you don't give a name, then you can be arrested. And so I was like, okay, that's interesting. I wonder if there's a law that says you're actually required to have a name. Well, actually, there isn't. So then the question is, well, how can I give you something I don't have? And so I was just looking at all these little questions. And then, like, and it really boiled down to communication. I was very much into human dynamics, watching the energy interplay between people, how to master and guide situations so that they would be to my outcome. And looking at the power of language, the power of words we use, how they create distortions, how they create... um, blocks, controversies, how they reflect our own inner shadow and end up biting us in the ass. So you look at the dynamic. Whenever any individual engages with any kind of authority figure, um, and this could be even be like a, a parent in your life, or it could be a government authority, it could be anyone. But there's always this dynamic, of, especially with um, so-called governmental authorities, of asking questions. Walk up, police officers, council officers, judges, whoever it is that's representing the establishment, is always asking questions. And what have we? What do we do? We went to school for fifteen years, and every day we were taught that if we put our hands up like a good little boy and answer questions, and we get them right, we get a badge, we get some treat, we get some. You know, it's a good thing. We, we answer questions. Um, but I looked at this, and this is where the power dynamic comes. The, the key is actually in the word. He who is asking questions is as king, the one in charge, the, the, the regal power in this situation. So I was turning it around. I was looking at this and saying, okay, so in a situation, you find yourself confronted with a police officer who's pulled you over for, for um, some parking offense or whatever it is. How are you gonna How are you going to play this so you don't end up in police stations, you don't end up with all this hassle and shit. How are you going to do it honorably so you're not going to create a fight? So what's, obviously you're going to get asked a question, what's your name? How many ways are there that one can ap- reply to a question? You know, you can answer affirmatively, yes, in which case you've just given away your power, you've, you've, you, or you've consolidated the question, answer, power game that he's presumed already to be in charge of. You can answer negatively, in which case you create a controversy. Be ready for that. You can stay silent, in which case you've just agreed by silence in the law. You can make a statement, but now you've got the burden of proof. There's not really many options here, except that if we're on this journey, if we're on a, some kind of a journey of awakening, we're recognizing perhaps that, you know, in a lot of the things that I used to think that I knew are not really true. Actually, maybe in truth, I know nothing at all then with that kind of humility, we can go into these situations and perhaps with a little more of the innocence of a child, ask some questions ourselves because I don't understand. Because generally, I don't understand. You guys make 3,000 new laws every day in this country alone. And you're telling me that I should understand man's law? I don't know a lawyer that understands all of man's law. It's written in a language called legalese that isn't even English. How am I supposed to understand it? So how can I possibly answer any question that you as an authority figure representing that law can possibly put to me? How can I? I can't. I can't. And I'm humble enough to accept that. So I'm going to ask some questions. I'm going to come with a loving, in a loving space, a non-confrontational space, first of all. I'm going to ask you some questions. And I guarantee, because you went to the same school, Mr. Police Officer, that I went to, or one similar to it, and you got taught to put your hand up like a good little boy as well. 
and you answered all those questions. And you might have been trained for this job that you're doing, but it's rooted in your psyche to answer questions. So as you ask me questions and I ask you questions to gain more clarity, I guarantee that within five questions, I'm going to ask something that's going to push your button and you're going to be compelled to answer it. And once that's happened, I have already got the chink in your armor and you don't know it yet. So I'm going to carry on asking questions. I'm going to play to your ego, ask you the right questions. It's going to get you to answer. And you're going to be in another 10 questions. I'm going to be the only one asking questions. And you're going to be the only one answering. And you have no idea still that I am in complete control of this situation. And will, I will leave it when I choose and not the other way around. Now, from this point, I would just look to, to architect four or five carefully crafted questions that would leave him with no alternative but to say, thank you, have a nice day, and get out of my life as quick as possible, please. And so this was my path. This was, this was my process. And I figured that by sticking with this, um, that it was infallible. No identity. Never give, never give a name. Never allow yourself to be identified and allow it to proceed. If you don't get past this, nothing else matters. There is not a single person in the Western world who is in jail who did not agree to be the first witness against themselves by doing this one thing. And so this was the, the knowledge that I had, or the information that I had, knowledge that I thought I had going into this, that really did become real knowledge as I went through it and experience. Um, and this gave such a massive boost in confidence. You know, all the fear fell, fell away. Within one or two, fell away. about the third time I had any engagement with colleagues, I was just walking into it with little to no flutters, no butterfly, no flutters, no anything. It was just like an experience. Um, and this actually got to the point where, I mean, it was a small town. There were like 17 police officers maybe on, on the shifts and stuff like that. So over the co course of a couple of years with at least a dozen encounters and engagements with police, I got to know them all personally, first name basis with most of them. And half of them were a, I thought, a little bit crazy, but the other half were like, hey, there's something to this. How have you walked out on a verifiably jailable offence in two hours um, when we've got all the evidence to secure a conviction? How is this possible? And so they might see me walking around town and literally pull over to offer a lift just so they could get 10 minutes in the car to ask how the law worked. This is the power that I realised I'd found that the authority itself, the, or those representing authorities, order followers, uh, were coming to people like me to find out how the law worked. Uh, and this was, the, this was the, the power that we had. That's pretty fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so many more stories I could, I could run into here. Um, it was probably about a year in. So with that, I explained that there was a, a mortgage situation that we were in. Um, and when a court summons arrived, I took the decision to go with my ex-wife now to um, the solicitor's office. Now, we've had a lot of discourse, written communication with this mortgage company, asking questions, you know, like, just, just asking questions again. You know, please, can you just show me the original note? Please, can you just explain? What, what you did with that. How did you securitize it? Can you explain these questions? Because it's my understanding that maybe this mortgage is not all it cracked up to be. And if you can just prove to me that actually you did lend me some money, then you know I'll rock on. We'll carry on paying it. it. There was no capacity to do that. So this summons eventually came. And because they'd seen we were going to be in trouble, they hired the senior partner of one of the leading foreclosure firms in the country. So I made an appointment with him, went to his office. He was expecting me to be a bit belligerent. Um, we were nothing of the sort. Um, and he really liked us. We were so kind and gentle and loving to him, but just asking a lot of questions again. And, he's, and he says he really believed that he was going to win. And he was genuinely compassionate. He says, look, guys, please don't. I, I don't want to take the house from you. Please don't. Please don't do this. Please don't ignore it. You're going to have to deal with this situation. And um, you know, really just trying the, the fear pill again, as always. And 
we were quite clear on what we were, where we were going on this whole journey. And it gets to the end of the meeting anyway. And um, gave him a big hug, <laughs> this this lawyer in his £3,000 suit. Gave him a big hug. He was a bit shocked. Wife gave him a kiss. And uh, we were off. About a month later, we see him in court. And we sat there in the waiting room. We're beaming because this is like it's another opportunity to just go and, yeah, to go and really... Uh, express oneself in the lion's den. This is like the, living on the edge. And I've been living on the edge now for every single minute for the last 12 years, basically. And it's fun because this is where the growth is. If you're not insecure in this moment, you ain't in a place where you're actually growing. Insecurity on the edge of our capacities, where we're insecure, is where all this wisdom can flow forth, where we learn. Um, and I just love being in that space. So it was great and we were sat down I think there was about an hour delay with this thing so the solicitor was sat there as well the lawyer and um, he was ill and he was really bothered really liked us so he was, he was really bothered by this situation and we said how are you I'm losing my will to live and we said we we're always already in this space we're full of love he's full of fear and not wanting to do his job today <laughs> we get into the courtroom in, in the end and um you know, the fact is, if you're taking this identity issue, if you're going to actually be true to yourself now and not identify yourself as a dead estate that the system is in control of, then you're not going to be able to use that identity anymore. And that's the identity that's a party to this case. If I had to walk in and say, look, I'm, you don't have to allow me access, but I just came here today because I'm an interested party. You know, we are the man and woman that use that house. We're not the named defendants but we use it. Is there anyone here in this room today or can the claimant pre pre present anyone that has a higher claim to the use of this property than us? No. That was it. I don't, we don't really care what you do with your pieces of paper because it's not fucking real. And it's our agreement to these false light Wooden, I, wooden icons, essentially, pieces of paper that make them real. It's the same with everything. The reality is that that house was a real, tangible thing. I am a real, tangible thing. The title deed to that house is not a real, tangible thing. It's a construct of the mind of man that's memorialized on paper and recorded in a registry office, just like the, the legal name that I called myself for a very long time is not real. It's a concept created by the mind of man, memorialized paper and recorded in, a, in an office. That's all they are. If we get, if we start living lives that are based in reality, alone, forgoing all the fiction, instead just, just saying, reality, I'm here, present, to participate in life, the real life, drop all the bullshit, then there's really... Um, this is where the potential for freedom opens up in us. So in this particular instance in the court was, um, that was just an interested party. I couldn't, we, we had that conversation. We were there for about 20 minutes. And um, the, as the, the, the lawyer again was convinced, you know, he says, look, I'm, this judge asked him, what are you here to do today? He says, regrettably, I am here to um, for an order for possession for such and such property. And uh, he, he really was quite remorseful about the job he had to do. He really thought he was going to get what he wanted out of it. And uh, to cut a long story short, come the end of the, the hearing, the judge said, well, I'm going to grant an order for possession today, but I'm going to put a note on this order that the man and woman who live in that property are not the named defendants. And so essentially what actually happened because the, the, some reality and truth had been put on a fictional piece of paper. And so in, this, in essence, the bank had a piece of paper that allowed it to balance its books but without giving it the force of law to be able to reclaim that house. So for the next 12 months, we were left to use the place in complete peace, essentially. All the gas and water and electric... Um, the same thing was the same situation. Um, we were 
working for free, doing what we love. I was helping people with their legal situations. My ex-wife was a Reiki healer. We were doing all kinds of stuff for anyone. We're just not accepting anything in return. And so we were, you know, life of fiction and reality. And we were exploring this life of pure reality, so which is no money. Money, another fictional construct, the mind of man, another totem, which to most people is, is the, the bonds of their enslavement. It doesn't have to be that way as we know now. We step out and we can, we can as we step into our own self-mastery, we can work with these other things. But that's besides the point. At this point in time in my life, we were just living a life in reality. Um, and so we were growing some vegetables in the garden and it was, it was really utopia, essentially, already. There, that, it was like a one-year taste of utopia. Um, and I was deep in self-inquiry on the self-realization path. And what happened at, um, actually during that year, I was shown information that showed me that there was a massive difference between spirituality and enlightenment, that the two were not the same thing. In fact, that they had very little, to, if anything, to do with each other, that enlightenment was not never going to be a mystical experience. It was not going to be pixies dancing through, dancing on rainbows and stuff like that. That just wasn't what it was. But enlightenment is simpler, nothing more or less than the ability to see everything the way it really is. Truth, absent the filter of my own perception. And when I realized there was a difference between these two things, I was like, spirituality? Fuck that shit, get it out of there. I'm not interested. Um, I want to know the truth. And I want to know it more than anything else. I want to know it more. I value that. I value that truth more than I value the sum total of everything else in existence. More than I value my identity, the things I have, all the, uh, my reputation, all of the things that make up Greg, all of the things that comprise who and what Greg is. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really interested in any of that. In the face of the truth, I'll take that truth. And that's what it takes. Basically, it's that simple. Enlightenment is so goddamn simple that the moment that you really choose on every aspect of your multidimensional self, that you choose truth above everything that makes up who and what you are, you'll have it. And so for me, from this, this time, it was four months, literally four months I spent on this enlightenment path. And then sat in the garden one day. And I've been going through all these different self inquiries, asking, you know, like, you know, who or what am I? And trying to experience the answer, going through all this stuff, and really looking, delving deep, asking every kind of question myself I could. Uh, but after four months, I was sat in the garden one day, and I was getting a bit, I was a bit, felt a bit frustrated. You know, what is it? Um, this, yeah, the sense of frustration around. Um, feeling, if anything, more confused, more asleep than anything from going through this process. And so I sat there in the garden and uh, I remember just thinking, well, I guess it's okay. If it never happens for me, I guess it's okay. And then that was it. There was the, like, the last, obviously the last thing that was keeping me from it was this idea that I needed it. And so the moment I actually surrendered and let go, needing this thing called enlightenment it was just there and boom it's like a little light bulb and there was nothing mystical about it there's nothing complicated it was just oh now i see things the way they really are and i started laughing because it was hilarious and there was a certain process of adjustment it was felt like i was kind of new and had to learn to use you know, like a sharp knife chopping tomatoes it felt like i was learning to do stuff all over again there was not, without the psychological self present, uh, no sense of Greg whatsoever. There was like, it wasn't me that was doing these things anymore. They were just all happening through me. And so this was a real big breakthrough in my life. And I spent the next probably 18 months in this state of where there was really no Greg. It was just, it was just a conduit for, for, for life. And so it was in this space that then... Uh, 
about a year after that first court case, the bank decided they were going to come and evict us anyway without a lawful order of the court. And so we were never going to abandon the place. So we put ourselves in our house. We locked it up. The doors locked as any other sane person would. And we said, you guys do what you've got to do. Anyway, they decided they were going to come in and physically remove us from the house. So we made them carry us out. But we had maybe 40, 40 pot plants growing in the back garden with, you know, potentially a good couple of kilos of weed dangling off them. And, um, and so the police who'd been called to support the bailiffs because we were going to be such troublemakers, of course, um, were there and found these and we were arrested and taken to the um, station. And this was one of those jailable offences that they thought was open shut. And so when they see us walking out in a few hours' time, um, they're, they're all stood there. The entire station, the entire police station from the whole district, there was about maybe 20 of them on duty at the time, because of the place. They're all stood there, inspectors, sergeants, all police officers, they're all stood there because they're scratching their heads, they don't understand it. And the inspector's there trying to book us out. And, um, but I'm still asking questions. He said, um, so why am I being released? He says, because there's insufficient evidence to secure a conviction. I said, well, does that mean I've done nothing wrong then? And you can see the look on his face, it's killing him to say that. He said, yeah. I said, okay. So when are you going to return the plants? And the look on all of their faces was <laughs> like, you cheeky motherfucker, how can you possibly ask this? But to me, that was a serious question. Right? It's, it, what? If we actually do completely let go of all of that conditioning, all of the things that we've been taught, all of the ideas that we've been given, yeah, any even um, the idea that we will get, we will have a problem if we do A, B, or C, or that authority will act to situation A, B, or C in this way. The child doesn't think like that. You return to a truly innocent space. You're not thinking about any of that stuff. And so. Um, so I approached it like, yeah, I would approach every situation like, it seems crazy to me. I mean, it does. Think of the truth of the situation around cannabis, mm. that you're telling me that a natural plant that's actually growing in the earth, it's not under any man-made lights or anything like that, it's growing naturally in the earth, in the garden, you're telling me that there's, there's something wrong with this. Yeah, it's, an, it's, <laughs> it's, it's actually an anathema. Yeah, it's, it's an anathema to reason or common sense yeah, and if you just question this like you're oblivious like it's ridiculous like it is as it's as ridiculous as it is and you question it and make it look as fucking ridiculous as it is then that's where you that's where um the magic happens yeah without any of these ideas or fears that we're holding or expectations so if you have, you have an ex you go into any of these situations with an expectation for example, in this situation, police officer A is going to do X in situation B, then you're going to create that. So you walk in like, you have to walk into life, into every situation in life, like um, nothing is fixed, nothing is set, nothing is certain, and I am the creator of this. I am the master of my reality. And what I say in my reality goes. And this is the power that we have. And I was just sensing and tasting this power been stepping into it and so I was asking these kind of questions and so he said um, he said are they being destroyed I said oh, well, you must have you must have I'll accept like kind uh, that you've got a nice little store in the background anyway in, in the end it was late and I just decided not to push it got you know so we went home we went back home to the house and we retook the house um, it was locked drilled out the lock put my own lock back in and then, you know, a couple of weeks later, someone from a bank appeared and we were a bit surprised, or an estate agent, a bit surprised to see that there were people back living there. So we went through the whole process again. And a few weeks later, there was another eviction, did it. Seven times we did that. Um, and bear in mind, like, like I say, I was going through this, this self-realization time in my life. It was about letting go of everything about who and what I was. I didn't want the house. It was never attached to the house. Didn't need it, but it was about it was more about this experience and learning about the power that we actually have. So I was milking this and really getting all the wisdom I could from the situation. So, you know, if we 
after a couple of times I started putting metal shutters up at the window so I went back with an angle grinder and I cut holes in the fucker and dragged it <laughs> off and put the window back in the police would turn up halfway through but they didn't see me halfway I'd be a high, a high officer we had so much fun became the best of friends with all of them well not well perhaps not the best of friends but it was it was um, it was funny nonetheless <laughs> and you know there was there was a lot of these kind of instances but um, it got to the end of it all and I was like you know I feel like I'm done here I feel like I've done everything I kind of feel like I've got much more work to do here so, but it would be nice to see if this stuff stands up against the best that the system has to offer the highest of high court judges and I stand toe to toe with him and maintain this uh, invisibility if you like and I do that so I looked at everything that had happened over the last couple of years and there were quite a lot of injustices you know during those there's evictions, there's probably like £30,000 worth of stuff, jewellery and all kinds of things taken from the house, um, the house itself. There was all kinds of um, breaches of law and stuff against us. So I filed this, this paper, the Bill in Equity, listed tons of judges, police officers, bailiffs, um, a lot, you know, locksmith, everyone who participated in everything. Um, against us over those couple of years and I went to the court and I never wanted any of the stuff that was in there uh, but I was I, was, I made the paper as cheeky as I could I claimed two kilos of cannabis from the Cheshire police force in order in there you know stuff that was like uh, this paper's going to get to the so they're going to assign someone high to deal with this so I, so I go into the um, court uh, room and she wasn't going to take it the the admin girl on the desk the clerk and so knowing a little bit about the law I went into the toilet I got a piece of toilet paper got my pen out and I hand wrote a writ of mandamus which is put an order compelling a public servant to fulfill a duty I just wrote writ of mandamus you know, file this paper date name sign that was it really really simple handed it to her and she said shit so she takes the paper she takes it before a judge and um, and you know, an hour later, there's the hearing schedule for like five days' time at the the main courthouse in the northwest of England. So I get there, and before the highest judge in the north of England as well. So I got exactly what I wanted. So we arrived there at this courthouse. A friend, I take my friend with me. I think I think it was like a Monday morning, sort of ten a.m. And the place is closed. We're not closed. It's open, but there's no. There's like maybe I don't know eight, ten courtrooms in this three or four story building and there's nothing else going on there they literally closed the whole thing down just because they didn't want to, just to, just for this case they didn't want the public to be to see what was going on so it was interesting it shows and i'm approaching this again in a space of love but look how much fear has gone into this event they're willing to spend probably a quarter of a million pounds to put this event on just to give all the other cases out of the way to give the judges a day off to give all of this kind of stuff just because they're so fucking afraid that other people might find out about the truth. And so I go into this, this courtroom and we're there for about an hour and 45 minutes and literally no one, like there's tons of people, suits from London, marking up this bill in equity and lawyers and it just cost them a fortune to put this show on. Probably twice as much as the house was actually worth in the first place. And... Um, The, the, this senior court judge was one of the kindest and most decent and wise and humble men I've ever met. And, you know, not perfect, but he was a good guy. He was wise. And he was definitely trying to work me, for sure. He was trying to testing me. Um, he was not going to give an inch. But we had um, uh it was kind of like a very kind gentleman's duel for an hour and 45 minutes where by my initial questioning, he understood exactly what I was doing. He did not go to the same school I did. He did not get taught to put his hand up a bit like a good little boy. He was taught how the game really works. So um, I'd met my match, essentially. It was, it was like equal the way. Um, and no one was going to really win this. And we, we weren't just questions we were making some we were talking around some things and different stuff but to cut a long story short after an hour and 45 minutes um, 
I said something like, sounds to me like what you're saying is that I am the subject of involuntary servitude and there's nothing I can do about it, i.e. slavery. And he thought about it for a couple of seconds. And then he looks back at me and he says, that's correct, Rick. Yeah. And I thought, wow, that is must be the very first time in history that a judge has gone on the record and said, we hold our people as slaves. So at that point in time, I was like, I didn't want any of the stuff in the paper. I just wanted this this meeting. I ran 45 minutes in, got that acknowledgement, and I was like, well, I don't get any better than this. So I just stood up, uh, or we wound it down after a couple of minutes of stood up and said, you know, thank you. This has been one of the most enlightening experiences of my life. I've learned a lot here today. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Thank you very much for your time. Have yourself a wonderful day. Much love to you and yours. And out of there. And that was it. That was the, that period of my life was just over at that point in time. And three days later, I met Sasha Stone and we got into New Earth Project and all this other stuff. And it was about building the new rather than destroying the old then. Um, yeah, that's, um, I guess, a large part of that part of the story for me. Dude, that's a fucking epic story. There's so many parts of that where I just wanted to go, wow. Oh, but you were in the story. I'm like, no, I'll just shut up. <laughs> you, can, you, can just, you can lay as many wows on as you know. Yeah. Well, there's just, so, I mean, I think most people just at the idea of like even going toe to toe and escaping a confrontation with the police officer, most people would be quite chuffed about that, you know? Mm -hmm. But to take it to that level of like keeping the house and, you know, basically winning in court where you could continue being in the house for a year and then certainly going to the highest, you know, court in the north of England and having them to admit that, yeah, we're basically all in servitude. Um, you really went head to head with the system, and came out on top. Well, Pretty I mean, much, you, or, it or depends on how you look at it. I mean, I've been the eternal optimist my entire life, which is why I think life has just rolled a red carpet out in front of me from day one. Mm. Uh, father was an eternal pessimist, so I was like, "Put that, mm. I'm, be, I'm, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna create the reality I want." So I was super optimistic. So whenever anything, I go through any situation that most people would actually see as a you know, something really bad that's happened to them. I'd always just see it as another godsend. And then life would roll out more red carpet in front of me. I didn't realize it at the time, but my whole life I've essentially been expressing gratitude without really, never saying thank you, but I was looking like at the end of every day. This is probably my biggest, this the, the thing I was doing as a child through my adolescence, through teens and early adulthood, um, the thing that was, I was made me so happy and successful without even knowing it was that basically at the end of every day, the end of every year, my birthday, these sort of times, I was always looking back and saying, wow, that was fucking awesome. What a day that was. What a week that was. What a year that was. And I mean, I called it gratitude, but that's what it is. And you cre you're creating your own reality that way every time you step forward. Well, I was thinking this when you were telling some of the story just and some of the stuff you got away with. I was just thinking to myself, there is no way you would have pulled some of that stuff off if you weren't conscious and in a loving space and treating people with that, you know, in a way where they can feel it. Even when you're with the police or with the judge, they can see that you're not a cunt and yeah. you're coming from a beautiful place. So do you see what I'm saying? And I yeah. think that was a huge part of it too. your state of consciousness, not just knowing the law, not just being willing to, to stand up for yourself. Do you see what mm -hmm. I'm saying? That consciousness seems to me was an integral part of what you've what you done. Yeah, well, I mean, that first, that, that uh, eviction I told you about, that first one, there was like, I don't know, four, three bailiffs, four police officers turned up outside. So I went out the back door and to speak to them, about half an hour talking to them. And I said, look, Greg, and you know, they, again, I was being loving and kind, so they, were, they didn't dislike me at all. I said, look, Greg, we've got a job to do. We're just following orders and we're gonna do it. So I said, all right. So I went around each one of them and I looked at them and said, you know, Regardless of what you do today, I still love you. But you should be guided by your conscience with what you do here today. And I went around each one of them and said something very similar, slightly different to that. And um, what, um, when I went back in the house and we locked up and they came in, it had really shaken them. Like they, they really not wanted to be doing, you see you, you come with that kind of love, they don't want to do that stuff. It has a massive effect on their consciousness because they can, they're starting to perceive the truth themselves in this. There was a, um, 
my ex-wife was pregnant at the time and um, noticeably so and so there was a female we weren't going to leave we were not going to leave that house using our own two feet you want to take you want to take us out you're going to have to assault us you're going to have to pick us up and put us on the street fine and so this female police officer just gets down she's please don't make me do this please don't make me do it. And, you know, they're, they're, they're actually destroying their illusions. You're showing themselves to themselves mm-hmm. in a way that they cannot carry on doing that job, telling themselves the story that they're somehow upholding justice when it's a crock of shit. But you have to go and be willing. If we're going to change this world, we have to be willing to go and stand there in the fire mm-hmm. and be it. And so that's... That's all we were doing. Now, I'm not suggesting that everyone needs to go and take a stance against authorities or go and do the same thing. Just like you're not suggesting everyone needs to go chat into women on the street. This was about overcoming fear. It was about tackling um, the societal degeneration. It was about all this kind of stuff. Um, but it was more about me. Yeah, it was about me stepping into myself, overcoming fear. Um, and it changed everything. Yeah, it's it's really an amazing story of um, self mastery, isn't it? You know, of what you can accomplish if you just put yourself to the test and think, you know what, fuck it, let's see, yeah. let's see how far we can go with this. Yeah. You know, and uh, you know, in your case, being from from the UK, your worst case scenario was a bit of jail time, but uh, so it was a good it was a good spot to be in. But, but I can I knew see that could... was my choice. I knew that jail time was my choice. Right. Yeah, like every other person ever being put in prison in the Western world. But it was their choice. And can I maintain the calmness and presence required to always make the right choice? And how I communicate. I know what it is that puts would put me in prison. Can I have the strength not to do those things? And so it was a test. Character, self. Yeah, it was all of those things. Yeah, it's fascinating. Now, devil's advocate part of me says, you know, if you're in certain countries and you get up to that shit, they're just going to take you in an alley, kick the shit out of you, and sometimes shoot you in the head. Well, this is what... This is, this is quite funny. See, I, after we left England, we're, so about a year after this, um, I was in England for another year or so after this, and um, working in the US on these kind of projects. And then we moved to Bali. Took the family there. And I would tell this story, these stories, to... All kinds of people I met. Um, you know, people, the expat people in Bali would say, yeah, that's all very well, but that's in England. This is Indonesia. This is the most corrupt country on the planet. You ain't going to get away with that shit here. And I was, I, I wouldn't argue with them, but I was like, yeah, it's, the <laughs> it's the same anywhere. Why is it the same anywhere? Because you're always dealing with the same thing, the human being. And here, if anything, in Bali or wherever you are, as long as you can speak the language, uh, and most of them speak English, then the same rules apply. And if anything, it's easier. Why? Because in Europe, we've actually been educated quite well. We have a relatively developed sense of intelligence and um, capacity for these things. Um, In Indonesia, there's a much more simple mindset to life. It's a beautiful thing. They have a much more simple life, mindset for life. So obviously I was going to, um, life was going to give me a situation to test this on. And I was just, it was, a, it was only a simple thing. I was riding through town on a scooter and I wasn't wearing a helmet. And the police officers there, they don't want to actually book you for anything. They just want to pull you to one side. And they're, they're hoping to bribe you. They want 10 bucks, 20 bucks. They want to get some lunch for the day. And, um, but I wasn't, I didn't want to give them that. I wanted to, I wanted to, use the situation to see if the same things applied. So I was, I was looking at him and I just saw, you know, this slightly different, more simple consciousness. So, so he's, the questions were, were different. He says, where are you from? I said, what do you mean? He said, what country are you from? And again, now think about what is a country? So I said, I, so I asked him, what, is, what, what do you mean by country? And he's just a bit confused. <laughs> anyway, he says, you know, what place, where, whereabouts, whereabouts are you from? And I said, he said, I don't understand. I don't understand. What is the concept of a nation? No, because what is a nation? It's another construct of the mind of man. I live a life in reality. I don't understand. So, so I said, are you 
trying to tell me that someone's taken planet Earth and broken it up into little pieces and called them something different. I think then that sounds a little bit crazy to you. Anyway, so he's scratching his head and he moves on to a different line of questioning. Got a long story short, within 10 minutes, um, the same the same things happen, but we've taken it further. I said, don't you think, brother, that every man has the right to use the public highway without being accosted by his fellow man? And he's going, yes, I do. I said, don't you think, brother? And he's going, yes, I do. And I said, all right, brilliant. Thanks very much. See you later. And we walked off. Because that's, yeah, because that's what he's saying. Yes, I have that right. You have that right. So, okay, so why are you interfering with my enjoyment of today then? I trust you're not going to do it again. I'll let you off this time, though. Love you, brother. Ciao back on the scooter in a way and it's it's a it's a state of mind a state of being and a perspective and a willingness to look at what is actually real and not in this world yeah yeah i mean what a way to shine light on the darkness of the matrix on the absurdity of the matrix you mm -hmm. know just by being in the truth and using the real law yeah. To just snap people out of it. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. It's almost like you're weaseling your way out of uh, these situations with authority as well as enlightening the people who are trying to, you know, uh, get you in the matrix. You know, yeah. that you're basically waking them up a as they're trying to do their, their job. It's, mm -hmm. am it's fa amazing. So yeah. fascinating. Yeah. And, you know, my experience, um, and people say, that, well, this is just because you're from England. If you're from America, it'd be different. But I think rubbish. Everywhere I've been, I see the same thing. I see human beings that are decent. I see police officers that are decent. When you get through the facade, are actually really decent human beings, most of whom went into that job because they wanted to help. Right. They wanted to make a difference. They wanted to serve. And the question is, what are you, what are you going to choose to see in people? What you choose to see in people is what they will be. Yeah. You choose to well, it's the same as manifesting reality, right? Yeah. What, what, it's exactly, and this is what I was going to say to you. It seems like your spiritual journey started way before you were conscious of it, just in your belief systems, just in believing that the universe is, is positive and that it's you know yeah. serving you. Yeah. It's well, the same actually, thing. it's so, funny because the biggest illusion I faced around that self-realization time, the biggest thing I had to let go of was the illusion of my own positivity. Yeah, my whole identity was based around this Mr. Positive attitude that made me land on my feet in everything I was doing, but it was false. It was still false. It's false positivity. So I know there's a lot of people on the self-improvement path and the self-personal development path that espouse this real positive attitude to life. And it's true. That's, that's if you're going to have, we should, we, we positively co-create our realities. But if we're, if this positive quality this positivity is a quality of our character that we identify ourselves with and it just becomes another prison so i was letting just questioning and letting go of all of these things i had to actually delve into my negativity for a couple of months in order to come back out the other side balanced you know now i'm, I'm i have an extremely positive outlook on life but that's because it's natural to be that way not mm. because it's some manufactured process that's that I've created to protect myself from the trials of life, yeah? You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I've had the same realization. Uh, and how long did you spend studying, like, the law? Like, yeah. I mean, we're talking online, books, libraries. I mean, if you, if you had to really... I spent many thousands of hours. Thousands of hours, know, like right? 8,000, 10,000 hours. But, wow. but, but, <laughs> but, um, that was all before this story and what kicked me onto this path and go uh, to doing all those things in that story I've just told you was recognizing that everything I just studied was a crock of shit <laughs> that I'm actually pretty intelligent and have a good aptitude for law and if after 10,000 hours of study and they say 10,000 hours makes you an expert in anything if after 10,000 hours of study I cannot understand all of that stuff then it ain't the truth yeah, and there's lots of people out there who will never ever be able to understand this shit. So it's not the truth. It's not the answer. It's not the way. So I th so I discarded it all. I forgot everything I'd learned. Just threw it all out, and then started this process of self inquiry to look at what was real, what the truth was amongst all this. Um, and that was where it began, really. So there's no need for an understanding of law. People would be, but everyone's got an excuse. They'd say, yeah, well. You're extremely articulate. You understand the law. You can, 
I'm sure you sure you navigate through these situations. I'm not that articulate. I get caught up all the time. So bullshit. This the the art of asking questions is so incredibly simple. Anyone can do it. If you get caught short, you only need one word. Works in any situation. Why? Mm -hmm. Why? It's a question. But because I don't understand. And this is the simplicity of it. And and again, I'm not. Um, saying that people should be going out and practicing this everywhere. We need to go and face our fears and take our own path, our own unique journeys. But it's about wherever the, your biggest fear is, go and run and face it now. If it's just spiders, then go and pick up as many as you can. I don't know, eat a few if you want. <laughs> do what, just do some, do, do some crazy shit to overcome your fear. And it's going to punch a hole in your reality that you can walk through to get to some to a truthful life, to get to a more loving life, to get to who and what your self mastered self can be. Yeah, true words have not been said. It's just straight to it. Fucking brilliant. Well, what a story. Um I mean I suppose it continues a bit. It continues right up to here. That's <laughs> how long taken us to six years ago. So I, I, yeah, I mentioned that um met Sasha and started working on these remarkable projects and doing the craziest stuff, um, most of which is not appropriate for me to talk about in this podcast, and remarkably advanced free energy technologies and um, healing modalities and conscious community projects and all kinds of everything, the full spectrum of human societal reboots and literally having them aggregating the most amazing people, technologies, things, everything that exists on this planet today to go into these, these places. And we have a project in Sierra Leone where the government's literally giving us 100,000 hectares to create our own sovereign state on, uh, uh, essentially, a exemplar of what conscious community and action can be. Now, all of these different doorways are opening up at this point in time. Um, and I guess what happened for me after maybe 18 months or so in that enlightened state, I started to fall out of it. And I've been pushing myself. It's actually very easy to, to live an uh, enlightened life. If you're just going to be like the Buddha, you're going to sit on top of a mountain or whatever, contemplate your navel and how delightfully wonderful you as God are in this world. Um, you know, it's pretty easy. It's a bit boring. You know, we were born into these human bodies to do stuff. I've got a mission here in life. I've got shit to do. Um, and so it never felt right to me to just be there in that bliss, enlightened state. But to step back into the world, the question was, can I, can I embody that kind of enlightened state in the storm? When there's a thousand things going on, I've got... 29 different projects on the boil, 1,000 emails a day coming into the inbox. Can I handle that shit and stay in that self-realized state? Uh, and the answer was no. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the point is that you have to go into that and then back out of it and into that and back out of it and you become and you integrate more and you, your power increases. The amount of things you can do, what you can manifest, uh, your self-belief and the yeah, the power that is coursing through your veins increases as you're out in, out in of this state, grounding more and more of you into this kind of self-realized reality. Um, and there we have real power. We can make a real difference in the world, whether it's be for ourselves with the, uh, in the things that we do, the lives that we choose to lead, or um, it would be, as in my case, so, and I recommend this for everyone, that you spend a good, portion of your life doing something that ain't for you something bigger than yourself it's gonna one of the ways that we cut through so much of our shit we all are our opening is because it's actually some kind of an expression of love we're actually doing it's something bigger and beyond ourselves and uh, and you know this you're doing exactly the same thing now yeah part of uh part of waking up is realizing you know, it's funny because people make jokes. You know, people are young and they think they can change the world and they join the real world and they realize they can't. Well, they get, 
That's that, that's more bullshit right there. The, the 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 real truth is, as you wake up, you fucking can change the world, but not until you change your own personal world. When you when you wake up to your own reality and realize who and what you are, and then get into your you know the reality of your own power, then you fucking can change the world in a profound way. But it's a process to to you know you got to work through your own shit to get to that place. Yeah, I mean the cosmic joke of it all was that you get to this kind of enlightened state where everything is done. Everything's perfect just the way it is. That first time in my life I didn't need to change the world anymore. Right. And what, within a couple of months, in one to my life walks the biggest opportunity to play at the highest level in actually changing the world. And it was almost like life saying, Okay, now you don't need to change the world, now you've got the power. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's such a beautiful mm -hmm. duality. Yeah. And even yeah. then, it's not done. The journey is never over. Since then, I've been stepping more and more into my power, especially over the last year, more and more. Um, we talked about that San Pedro experience we mm. did. During that, I came face to face with the sheer terrifying power of who and what I am at the core. Real, from the darkness to the light in one vortex, this storm. You know, that I am the storm. And... Um, it's the, we quite literally are wielding the power of God itself at our fingertips. All of creation is manifest in this one physical form. All of it. And I wield all that power. And the job really is just to, is, is nothing more than, there's nothing new to learn here. No, no one's giving new information out. What, I, what I'm sharing here isn't new information. It's stuff that's supposed to point people towards letting go of ideas or all the stuff they need to let go of because there's nothing new to learn because we're already it. We've been it from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that prevents us from stepping into it is the fault, all the false bullshit we've built up, false beliefs, faulty definitions of what love is, false, false selves, all of this stuff that we've built up that essentially just protect ourselves from the pain we experienced as infants, the cosmic abandonment we experienced when we come into the world pain of this we create these false selves to protect ourselves um, undo it and it's not that difficult a process really if you want it but that's what I find in in the conscious groups that we, we, we move through is that um, there are a lot of people that are only telling themselves that they want it and don't want it because the moment you want it it happens starts happening boom 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 one day after another every day is like this unfolding of amazing shit every single day you know it yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's just getting more and more so every day mm -hmm. to the point where today i'm sitting here talking to you just going i can't believe this is my life what the fuck yeah. you know and and just the immensity of it sometimes if i really think about it it's almost uh you know kind of i get this feeling like I'm going to freak out. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. And it's just like you can't. You can just, could just keep going and accept. Just accept and just uh, allow it to be. Just allow mm -hmm. it to be. And we deserve it. I deserve it. It's really, that's what it is. It's like just allowing life to be that fucking awesome because we all, as, uh, you know, incarnations of supreme consciousness, we're it. We're all of it. And we deserve it. And why Why wouldn't we? Yeah. Why wouldn't we? Yeah. And it's that simple. Well, the, the reason why we wouldn't is because... We don't feel we're worthy. It's a yes. lack of self-worth, which is a lack of self-love, because we've just not seen these big aspects of ourselves that have been cut off, that we hide from. You say hide from, we don't even know they're there. That's why it's called shadow, because you can't see it. It's hiding over your shoulders. Sometimes other people can see it, sometimes they can't, but it's there. And we deny it, because we can't see it. And the first thing is to get over the denial. As long as you're denying yourself... How are you ever going to heal yourself? But that acts, it's what we talk about, truth. Why it's one of the most valuable qualities on this journey because you have to be truthful with yourself. And item number one, truth. I am a dick and so are you. And that's it. And it's okay to be a dick because none of us are perfect. We never have been. And it's okay. And we can, you, start accept, you start accepting your own dickheadedness, then you start accepting everyone else's. You're more tolerant of everyone. Peace ensues. You create a 
the way for you to heal yourself because you're accepting of yourself. You look at yourself honestly, see where your psychological self exists and where it's not working for you. You see, and once you see it, it just deconstructing it's simple. Yeah, it's a it's one of the profound uh, lessons you know me and Marcus, who I work with, have been saying from the beginning. It's one of our mindsets. It's just that, yeah, I'm a dick. Mm -hmm. So what? I'm a bit of a dick, mate. You know, it's important because if yeah. you if you're if you're not that, you're putting a tremendous amount of pressure on yourself to be perfect, to be good, to be right all the time. It's like fuck that. We're all human. We're all fucked up. We're all assholes. Yeah. yeah. So, you know. And what you end up doing is you end up castigating yourself when you don't live up to your own high standards. That's right. And what you've got is very real thing actually inside you, right? The the birth of you, or when the birth of the you you are now is created through this pain that you're experiencing as a little baby, as a little young child. Um, it's like that there's almost a separate entity there this little boy or little girl that has blo blocked itself in through false belief structures and it's hiding away in there and quite literally every time we're castigating ourselves derogating ourselves is something we've done that we don't we don't like we're quite literally beating that little boy that little girl into submission continuing the same treatment that made it create those walls in the first place. Why did it do it? Lack of love, in one way or another. So how are you going to resolve it? Love him. Love her. Find it. Fall in love with yourself. I don't just mean self-love like most people talk about. I mean, actually, fall in love with yourself. Make yourself your primary relationship. Yeah. And from there... From there, it's easy because everything burns away in the presence of pure love. Everything. Yeah, I tell I tell myself that sometimes. You know, when any time I get any of these thoughts and any fear, even just just worry, even just little worries, you know, I just go, "Oh wait, if I just really think about the absolute love that I am and getting myself to to just the, you know that higher level that I that I felt, is does this even exist?" And the answer is always no. <laughs> It never does. It never exists. Whatever you're worried about, concerned about, frustrated about, it doesn't exist if you're at the right uh, level of love-based yeah. consciousness. Yeah. That's a fact. Yeah. And I forget it. And then I remember it. And I go, oh, yeah. <laughs> and so literally, you do this for, for long enough and you really do it truthfully with yourself. Mm -hmm. And the point comes where it doesn't happen anymore. It doesn't come up. Mm -hmm. Fears don't come up anymore. Those thoughts don't come up. Mm -hmm. um, or if they do, in the moment they're arising, you're recognizing they're not you, and they just enter into oblivion. They're quite literally extraterrestrial impositions, all kinds mm -hmm. of stuff going on behind the scenes in this multidimensional reality there is that we've got no idea about most people. There's, there's, quite, literally a, there's quite literally a war for love being fought on extra-dimensional planes. Various entities interposing through the shadows of human beings all over the place. And until we attain a level of self-mastery in and of ourselves we will always be susceptible to all this stuff yeah there's real motivation here guys to to do this you know it's the only way everyone wants what a happy life wants to be happy successful whatever there is no true happiness without self-mastery mm. everything else is a poor imitation it will never take you there nothing you do None of the self-improvement stuff will work unless you go and deal with the root stuff, love and truth, and embody it and become it. I am a love. Become it. I'll be honest, Greg. I don't think we're going to top that fucking sentence right there. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we should uh, wrap it up, and we'll definitely do it all again. But uh, I should say to the world, wow, um, this is been probably one of the most amazing podcasts we've had so far. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure people are going to go ape shit. Uh, I'm going ape shit. I'm, I, get, I, you get, book your flights, guys. Get God, yeah, to Bulgaria. Well, this is what I wanted to say. Holy shit. I am so excited that you're going to speak at Infinite Man Summit, Bulgaria, May 26th, 28th, uh, 2017. Can we get a little inkling of maybe what wisdom you're going to share? Yeah, well, I think I'm um, going to focus on the, the essence of of what we've talked about today, which is the, to the tools we need to actually jump beyond this 
murky soup of life that we find ourselves in? What are those tools? How do we, how do I actually discover and align with truth? How do I step into myself and actually become love itself? And, you know, this is a, this is a man's event. How do we, we're all being called right now as men to step into our divine masculine potential, true embodied divine masculine, the balance of masculine and feminine within, where relationship with others, with women, with everyone and everything in life becomes a balanced dance. This, I guess, is the area I'd like to take things in. We need a army of divine masculine warriors going out changing this world. Let's create it. Let's. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck yeah, I couldn't sum up what the what the event is about better than that. It's like, you know what I mean? Like, we are fucking, we're it, man. We're yeah, it. We've always been it. We've always been it. And I, and I really felt that at the, at the last event. It was like, wow, these guys are fucking on it. They want it. They're it. So, um, yeah, the, the clearer we can get and the more we can, you know, give them the tools and the realizations to go out there and really, you know, clean this fucking planet up, raise that consciousness. There's nothing more beautiful than that. Yeah. I'm so excited that I met you and that we're friends and that you're going to come speak at this event, dude. It's Likewise, going to be brother. fucking mind-blowing, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this event is going to be fucking mind-blowing. First of many. Yeah, no shit. Dude, I, I wish we had cameras just so I can film this big smile on your face <laughs> and, uh, and give you a big hug on camera. But uh, unfortunately, just audio for now, folks. But that may change in the future. Uh, this has been an absolutely epic Woke as Fuck podcast. Uh, lots of love to you. Thanks so much for coming on. I know people are really going to appreciate it. And I really look forward to, to uh, seeing you again on the show and uh, in Bulgaria. Likewise. Thank you very much, man. See you soon. Much love. Peace out. So don't move. And I will just take a 